My name is Craig Hogan. Um, I'm from uh, Denver. I'm at the University of Colorado, where I'm the uh, chief of adult reconstruction there. I'm going to try to keep this a little bit different from what we heard this morning, but there will be some overlap, so I apologize. But at least I get to ask the questions now, and you'll get <laughs> differing opinions on how we handle a complex primary total hip, OK? So these cases were given to me, thankfully, uh, by Dr. Ward. I have a couple of my own later. But this is a 36-year-old female with inflammatory arthritis. Um, Walks with uh, significant assistance, uh, essentially wheelchair bound for nine years. You can see her um, physical exam findings there. But let's, before we see any x rays, inflammatory arthropathy. Um, Tom? Yes. You, you've been around longer than me. So have you seen a decline in the percentage of patients coming to your office with inflammatory arthropathies? I, I've not so much seen a decline as I've rarely seen a patient in the last 15 years like this one. Yeah. In other words, is this patient on any medications? So I'm going to say yes, right? So I think that's a good point. Why don't you talk about that briefly with the changes you've seen in your career with some of the newer medications to manage rheumatoid arthritis? I mean, unless this patient has such severe dysplasia, she's got stage four dysplasia, I've never seen a patient recently come in unable to ambulate unless they have all four joints involved, and especially not wheelchair bound for nine years. And most people are still able to at least stand and transfer. Yeah. So most of the patients are on reasonably good disease modifying meds now. That's why that's the first thing that sticks out to me in this case is why is this young a patient faring this poorly with this disease and what else is going on with them? Well, here, wow. here's her x-rays. So, yeah. Tad, will you comment real quick? We like to talk about the nuts and bolts of what we're going to do surgically, but how are you handling your patients with RA and their medications preoperatively? Yes, I'm guessing this is, uh, you know, somebody who had uh, JRA. So, you know, she's, that's, that's hence the severity and the difficulty managing it early. And uh, you, you touched on the disease modifying agents. You, need to get a ha handle on what what they're taking and uh, you know so methotrexate corticosteroid you you don't have to stop the methotrexate the corticosteroid if she's on that and probably isn't but you, you need to know and that it may require bolusing around it and then the disease modifying agents <clears throat> can really affect the uh, uh, re immunity the resistance to uh, infection and, uh, and some of those need to be stopped ahead in conjunction with the, the rheumatologist um, just other things, uh, you know, well, I won't get into the x-ray yet until you're ready for that, but um, size and morphology are uh, distinctly unusual here. Certainly. So, so are you managing their medications at UCSF, or does your Department of Rheumatology manage it? Because um, it's not clear, right? We, we continue to have these meetings with our rheumatology societies, and I think the most recent <laughs> recommendations were finding some consensus. Yeah. But I it's hard. There is reasonable consensus, but I think what's also what's happening is there's this constant uh, parade of new medications that, uh, you know, some of the names of which I, I can't pronounce and I'm not familiar with. And I think also uh, it, what's fortunate in rheumatoid patients, for the most part, <clears throat> tend to have a pretty strong relationship with their rheumatologist. And uh, it's not so hard to reach out and, uh, you know, come to some consensus about um, what to do with their meds. Um, but in general terms, what I just outlined for you is kind of how we're handling it. We stop the disease-modifying agents temporarily and work around the corticosteroid and leave the methotrexate alone. Okay, good. So um, can I just that, add something to that? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's right actually ahead. a really good um, paper from 2017, I think, that was in arth arthroplasty journals as well as rheumatology journals. That has there's just one table in it that is like. It's, it's really helpful. I have it actually on my phone just as a picture that I kind of refer to. It tells you exactly what the medications are, how long you need to hold it, when you can restart it. And sometimes that's good. A lot of times our prepare clinic isn't really on top of that. They don't see the patient early enough. So I think kind of seeing ahead of time, like, hey, you need to stop this monthly injection five weeks before, making sure that the, the patient is aware of that. Yeah, I'm sure everyone in the audience is aware of that table. It's a great review. I, I tend to sum, summarize it very simply. One cycle before stop it roughly two cycles post-op you're going to stop it that's sort of the yeah. summation of that so 
Let's get into um, one question here. So she was severely disabled, can't walk. Um, I don't know what her flexion contracture was. Let's call it, I'm gonna change it. 30 degree flexion contractures bilaterally. Tad, are you gonna do this? Yeah. Are you gonna do both at the same time? Well, you know, one, one of the things that's unusual that it's, it's that she's gotten this far before, you know, a consultation has, has been obtained. Um, so there are a couple of indications to do something here. One, of course, would be if she was in severe pain, just from a humane standpoint, but I haven't heard that stated, and, and, and maybe she isn't. But now you've got these severe flexion contractures, you've got issues of, uh, of hygiene, and, and you know, practically speaking, I think if her uh, hips moved better, she probably could get up and take a few steps. You know, she's not gonna, yeah. your, your, your functional goals are limited, but I think she could be better than uh, sitting in a wheelchair and, uh, uh, unable to stand up. I think it's possible to improve um, from that state of affairs. So yeah, from that standpoint, I think she is an operative candidate, probably not going to entertain a bilateral procedure in a rheumatoid patient um, just because the risks are high. You know, they're fragile for one thing. So the, the, the risk of having a, you know, a fracture or a, um, a you know, a mechanical issue in surgery is uh, higher than your standard patient and then the risk of infection and healing is greater so I would want to see if you one hip heal do well move on to the next one that's okay. that's kind of what I'd be thinking real quick Tom 36 years old we in North America are allergic to cement when it comes to hips that doesn't look like the bone quality of a 36 year old normal patient are you considering any other type of femoral fixation here I, I agree. She's a, you know, a door B minus slash C. She also hasn't ambulated for some time. I, I would still favor cementless fixation. I don't know. You say she's at its plastic. Certainly the socket is mildly shallow. I don't know if she has any version issues. I, I would probably use a two-piece stem here. Um, fairly, fairly narrow canals, big soft tissues. So I'd be thinking in my practice, this would be a case for an SROM. And yeah, you just have to be careful when you're preparing, et cetera, but I would still stay cementless in her. Okay. The only thing I would add in these patients, and I don't know whether people are doing this, but I always want a recent CRP and ESR. Not, not just to know their disease state, but if there's a problem afterwards, I like to know what it's gone to in comparison to their normal, sort of like, this is where I am. So I know if I may or may yeah. not have a problem. That, that's a good point. That's a good point. It's hard to interpret post-operative problems when our standard laboratory workup is sed rate CRP in these inflammatory arthropathy patients, unless you have an idea of where they live at baseline. So this wasn't my case. Someone templated this. Someone at UCSF um, looks like they templated it to the smallest stem size possible. They're thinking about cementless fixation. Go in. This is what happened. Um, I think some of the points that you guys all made about the quality of bone, it looks like something certainly something was realized here. Well, if you go back to the template, uh huh. Uh, <laughs> if that's your template, it's uh, and that's what you go with. That's you got a fairly predictable outcome, right? Uh, that that stem doesn't fit in that bone. Uh, so I, if I saw that and it was the smallest stem available in the uh, you know in the product that I use frequently, I'd be looking for something else. Okay. Uh, right off the bat, and I don't know what the actual distal diameter of that small stem size is, but you can get stems down to six millimeters uh, distally if you look for them. It's, it may not be what you normally use. Yeah. Well, I think that's really important, right? So what does templating do? <laughs> templating makes us think about the surgery beforehand, maybe do a mental dry run of it. We know from the literature that templating is about 85% sensitive in predicting implant size to about two size, or sorry, to one size. Maybe it's 90% sensitive to two sizes. But in this case, what it did for the surgeon is said, uh oh, that's the smallest stem, and I'm going to try to jam it in there, and what, what can potentially happen. So having other things around, I think, um, is sort of the learning point of this case. Uh, Dr. Barry, any other, Jeff, any other comments on that? Yeah, I think um, when, when I, if I saw a template like that, um, I think having a different stem available, like an SROM, like you talked about, or there's also the kind of primary Wagner style stems that are sometimes helpful for these really small cases where you can get some diaphyseal fixation in pretty small diameters. 
So you guys are lucky, right? You work at a big academic medical center. What about if I work in a small hospital and I ask my vendor to bring in 85 trays for my primary hip? I have three different stems, all these different cups. Is that, is that feasible? We talked a lot about cost containment before. There's a lot of processing fees that go along with getting those things ready for you. No, I think the, the point there is just uh, planning ahead. You can minimize what, what you bring in because you, you have a, an idea of what's going to fit, what's not going to fit. You take that, that Wagner-style stem, for example. Um, it's fairly simple. It's monoblock. It's splined distally so that you can change the version. Uh, if you need to, um, and not be uh, hampered by the proximal anatomy in turning it. Um, so uh, it's a way to create simplicity just in terms of your choice that you make. Uh, you've got to know that the, the, the distal diameter fits in what you've templated the size there, but that's, that's fairly easy to know. So I would say do, do the planning to make it more simple and to decrease this uh, you know, number of trays that need to come into your OR. Good. Okay. There's another tip Sorry, off on this case, back to your last slide. Mm -hmm. So for that shell, you have to get to 52 for a 36 head, which is sort of right standard size. I, I'm actually a little surprised they, the stem did not fit. We don't really, I don't think you had a mag marker on the last one. So I, I just, what I'm trying to figure out is that does look oversized, but what's the magnification of that film? Uh, one to one. I don't know. So, uh, it's so got, uh, too technical. Uh, it's got mag markers on it, so I think that's, <laughs> that's a 15% mag or whatever. You can measure it and know exactly right. uh, based on the mag markers. Yeah, your your point your point being but, that you're a little bit surprised at the some of the issues that were encountered on the femur there, given the size of the cup that was implanted, which would give you a guideline into and, maybe and the back, size of the patient. Is that where you're going with this? Back to point about the version. I, I, I'm not going to stand on my head here and say on that AP pelvis, it looks to me like you really don't have a true AP of that femoral component, right? Yep. So I just wonder if this is a versional issue that they got into. They crack proximally extended. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, okay. you know, to be fair here, if you look at this, this real stem um, doesn't look too big. So it's, it's also possible that it, this is just fragile bone. And sure. they had a stem size that seemed reasonable and put it in and the thing broke. Uh, given a non-ambulator and a rheumatoid, um, that's, that's also very possible too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, the, the, the point of this case is to bring up a lot of the thoughts around inflammatory arthropathy, maybe implant choices. Um, I know we're all scared of cement, especially in someone that's 36, but cement, maybe something that's cementless with a few more options um, to uh, get the uh, proximal distal mismatch done there. But same thing was done on the other side, minus uh, three cables, and this patient uh, now lives a very healthy life. So, so can we go back one? <laughs> so, so uh, with 25 or 30 degree flexion contractures, you know, my, my rule is basically I'm going to do both sides within eight weeks because they're going to end up going back to whatever they have on the other side when they try to stand and walk. Do you know why they waited a year? I mean, was it just this was too horrible on the left-hand side, too much for everybody? Uh, no, the, it was patient's choice. Okay. All right. So um, this is our next one. This is a 58-year-old male. Uh, several year history of right hip pain, otherwise healthy, limited hip motion, has a significant um, uh, limb length inequality, okay? Um, there's the motions there. I think that's written wrong. It's the, the right is shorter than the left by three centimeters, not greater. <laughs> so, Jeff, work up. Any laboratory stuff you want to see in this yeah, patient? Yeah, definitely going to make sure that <clears throat> there's no evidence of infection in this, uh, especially if you have if this happened over a short period of time. If we have any old X-rays, kind of comparing. But if it's just uh, you know inflammatory markers are normal, um, you know if he was a kind of a sketchy history of a guy, I may even get an aspiration in someone like this if they have any kind of weird social factors that might make me concerned about history of a septic arthritis. But otherwise, assuming no infection. Um, you know, I, I, I may get different views of the pelvis, trying to look at the columns, just uh, just so I'm aware of 
where things are at going in, but this kind of goes back to Dr. Blumenfeld's talk earlier about kind of preparing from what of what our tools available for an acetabular reconstruction am I going to use. Did we miss a history of trauma here? Was there? No history of trauma, just progressive pain over three, four years. Alcoholism, anything. So rapidly destructive hip. Well, it's thing. not just the hip. Yeah. You've got the <laughs> pubic rami. It looks yeah. like the whole hemipelvis is shifted up. Right. That's why I'm wondering about trauma. And uh, you know what I want more than anything on this, if I could possibly get it, is an x-ray from a year ago. Yeah. What, did this, what did this thing look like, and what has it turned into? Because uh, this, this is something unusual, particularly if there's, an abs if there's no history of trauma here. A steroid injection a year ago. <laughs> hey, good point, right? So we published a case report of a, of a, a patient of ours that had an intraarticular cortisone injection and rapidly went on to chondrolysis, avascular necrosis of his femoral head within three months and had a hip that looked like this. Thought it was infection. It wasn't. It wasn't. I think suffice it to say in this person, he's not telling you, but he probably drinks, I don't know, 10, 12 beers a day. Does that, does that change your mind? Still? No, not anymore, but he used to. Uh, up until two weeks ago? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Up until he said he stopped. Okay. All right. Well, so, la so labs are normal. <clears throat> What's the sensitivity and specificity of a CRP in said rate alone, Tom? Are you going to aspirate this hip? You guys have mentioned a lot about trauma or infection. Right. So, I mean, in the old days, it was over 90%, right? If both were negative, 97%. There are only 3% chance of being infected. Some of that's being questioned. I think, to me, it's pretty simple. I think he's, he's developed, I think, osteonecrosis, but he's got a lot, of, a lot of superior erosion, unless that's all anterior on the socket. So what's the downside of aspirating him if you're concerned? I mean, it sounds to me like this is not a straightforward guy. So if I have any concern, I'll aspirate them. Okay. Do you do the aspiration yourself? So I do it only on hips that have already been done. Otherwise, I let the radiologist do it. Okay. And what do you, what do you send your aspiration for? Is it just... So, so it's ahead. always sent for stat cell count differential, and then uh, we hold cultures now for two weeks. And then in weird cases, then we're adding, you know, fungal, AFB, those types of things. You don't send it to the East Coast for special labs? Jeff, you send in all your aspirations for a special test? Not, not primary joints. Um, if there's a confusing picture of a, of a replaced joint, then I think adding um, something like alpha defensin, or we've, we were involved in some trials that you see on some of the uh, DNA, uh, microbial DNA type things. Um, I don't know that those have a defined role yet, but sometimes in confusing cases, the more data points you have, the better. Okay. Um, but not in a primary. Okay. All right, so infection is negative. Um, go down the line real quick. How are you going to reconstruct the acetabulum, Tom? Well, I'd want a lateral, and I'd get you Dave views, and I'd decide if that's really an anterior defect, I'll bet you I could still do this with a hemispherical shell, but I'd have an augment available. Okay, augment available. Tad? So this, this is really an interesting one to contemplate. So if you look at the side notch, that's lined up. Then you've got... A uh, healed ramus fracture, you've got what looks like a fracture through the posterior column because you're looking at an iliac oblique on that right hand film. So it, it looks like the medial wall and the posterior column are disrupted. I think, I think so, that's the ischial spine, but, uh, all right, but well, I see from, what you're seeing. From there. where I'm yeah. sitting, I'm worried about a medial defect there on that uh, iliac oblique. And uh, so I would get a CT scan on this one, even though I'm not. Uh, one who frequently gets a CT scan, I think it would be helpful. And I'm really thinking uh, infectious or inflammatory process here. Something, uh, there's, there's something missing uh, that, that makes this uh, unusual and uh, the bone so fragile and um, eroded. And I just osteonecrosis of the femoral head just isn't, isn't enough here uh, yet to explain all this. Jeff, what are you using? Anything, anything you newer about, out, maybe? Yeah, so, um, you know, for these, when you have the kind of either using an augment to get the hip center back down, um, sometimes just, you know, there are a couple options available that can shift your center of rotation down um, that are kind of a built-in augment, but you're still using just a hemispherical reamer, so it's just a little more comfortable to do that because uh, that's what we're used to doing. Sometimes put it in kind of a jumbo cup, but it moves the center of rotation down as opposed to shifting it up. So I, I might have that available or I'd use that system um, that has that option okay. uh, to switch to. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then that, that's sort of what was used in this case, um, a hemispherical cup that automatically shifts the hip center down. Real quick, let's get the comments from, we'll go opposite direction. We used to treat dysplastics with a high hip center all the time. Why are we so concerned about bringing the hip center down in 2019? What's the problem with leaving it up? Well, I think the biomechanics are changed when you're moving it up. So your abductor is not going to function as well. Um, you know, the, I think that's the main reason. You're also getting different stresses on the, the socket if you're not kind of down and in. Um, I think those are probably the two biggest reasons. And I think that historically it was kind of, I mean, obviously it wasn't there, but historically it was probably put up and high because getting fixation with uh, the older sockets might have been a little more difficult. Um, but now with kind of the porous metals and we were talking about earlier, the percentages that you need to have good contact has probably gone down. I um, mean, our, our comfort level with them has probably gone up. So I think that's one reason that we're moving them down. There's also good studies, uh, and I think the Mayo Group in North Carolina, that when you are higher up, the risk of uh, issues uh, at, at mid to long term is much higher. Yeah, I mean, Ted, you can probably comment on those long term issues of high hip centers, the, the two biggest complications following that. He mentioned, you know, well, I don't know if you want to comment on Particularly on high and lateral, saw. you know, you're increasing the joint reaction forces. Yep. Jeff outlined that nicely. And so we would put a hip center high as a compromise. Uh, now we have the tools and the ability to restore the biomechanics and bring it down and fill a defect and have a better chance of getting fixation because we have improved surfaces on the implants. So uh, we have technology now that we, we didn't used to have when those papers about high hip center were written and the alternative was a bone graft. And a bone graft didn't work very well, wasn't predictable, um, you know, would, would, would fail, it didn't uh, behave like some of these uh, highly porous augments that we have now. So we're, we're in a different era where we, we don't have to compromise so much on that high hip center concept. But the, yeah. the other problem with the high hip center, and maybe the larger head's taking this away, is impingement ah. of troke against, against ilium. So that was one of, the two, one of the major issues with the high hip center. The other is, um, you are gonna tell us the diagnosis because it looks like it's happening on the left side? Yeah, avascular necrosis. Right. Yeah. So yeah, thanks for mentioning that, you know, high up center, you know, extra articular impingement was higher. So incidence of instability was higher. Tad mentioned the joint reactive forces. If you bring a cup, if you leave it high and lateral, the joint reactive forces are higher, which probably pretends to a higher rate of failure at midterm results. So I think most of us nowadays are going to do anything we can to bring the hip center back down to restore the natural biomechanics. So we're getting increasingly complex. <laughs> so this person is um, 42 years old, came into my clinic and stated that he was having pain. He had a history of trauma as a child. Um, I don't know what happened. Jeff, take us through these x-rays. <clears throat> yeah, so it's like they've had a hip fusion, right? Uh, or I don't know if it was purposefully fused. Like, it probably was, yeah. I, I haven't seen that kind of a construct for a fusion before. Um, but yeah, purposefully fused. Um, so, so issues with this are going to be multiple. Um, so, you know, getting some sort of socket fixation in that. Uh, is, don't don't go there yet. Oh, don't okay. go there. Hold on. Oh, um, <laughs> so, what are the indications? Oh, yeah. So why, for why would surgery you take here? Yeah. So I mean, um, he doesn't have any pain. <laughs> How old is he? He's uh, 42 now. Yeah. He's a manual laborer. He doesn't have any pain. Not in his back. But he has a cut. Oh, yeah, he does yeah, have pain in his back. Yeah, okay. Yep. So if you start getting back problems, um, that, that's maybe one, one uh, indication for potentially considering taking this down. Um, understanding that the complications of these tank downs are, are often quite high, um, especially instability, um, you know, fixation. Uh, it, it'll depend a lot on... Uh, the decision to do it or not if on the, the abductors and how, how they're right, functioning. Stop right there. Hold on just a sec. So, um, Tad, so what are the other things that, you know, these hip fusion patients, they come in, how do they even sit in your office? It's quite funny when you interview them, right? They, they, they literally can't sit, right? Yeah. It's very can. difficult. Some disguise this uh, very well. I'll just say for, um, just for references, there's two long-term follow-up studies, one out of Wisconsin and one out of Iowa on hip fusion. So just uh, for your, uh, your, your classic literature review, they're really good on this. And, um, and it's back pain, ipsilateral knee pain, typically that uh, leads to 
complaint leads to a you know consideration of a revision. And um, I can also remember as a resident uh, when Leonard Goldner was the uh, still around Duke, and um, he uh, he brought a patient into Grand Rounds and had him walk across the stage and uh, and you know was trying to stump the residents. You know what what's wrong with this patient? And obviously we got it all wrong, and it was a hip fusion. Uh, you couldn't tell. Now when they do try to sit, that's a tip because yeah. you know they sort of have to sit like this. Have to and be they a can't get in the car. Uh, but functionally, they can be very good for a long time. As uh, and we just don't see these very much anymore. All right, so Tom, um, he meets all the operative indications. Um, this was actually seven years ago during my board collection. My chief resident was so excited when he came back to tell me about the patient. He goes, he meets all indications. We got to do it. But it was literally between April and October. And I said, absolutely not. You know, we're we're going we're gonna to defer this case. So let's pretend we deferred it. Yeah. Comes back. What's your workup? Uh, Anything like, else? Yeah, I want to see what his back. So, so he's complaining of, as, as Tad, Tad pointed out, knee pain, back pain. What's he complaining of? He complains of back pain. With what? With like, any type of physical activity. And he's he a laborer. And he complains, and he's a manual laborer. He's, he can't function at his job anymore. And he hasn't sat in the front seat of a car for 10 years. Okay, he has to lay down in the back seat of the car because his hip doesn't move well enough, and he has a small car. So he yeah. can't physically sit in a car seat. Okay, so, well, okay, so, so to me, I'd have a frank conversation with him. One, I'd image his back. He has a lot of arthritis in his back. Okay, so first I got to make sure it's not the back that actually okay. bothers him. And then I'd have to have a conversation with him about the fact that he's unlikely to be able to return to his job. Okay, why? He's a laborer. He's a laborer. Well, what, oh, so he's out. He builds fences. So, okay, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and suggest his abductor function is going to be nil. How do we assess that, or do you need to assess it? Well, the only way you can assess it is you get an MRI and see if there's any tendon intact into whatever is remaining there of the troke. And then intra-op, you, the, you look at the muscle fibers and make some valuation of one, they're red, three, they're gray, they're deficient. But my point is, the problem we're trying to solve in a laborer would be different than a problem we're trying to solve in somebody who does, even though they can't sit, a desk job, or maybe they're in a standing desk, right? Okay. So I'd be absolutely sure it's not a modifiable, pro modifiable problem for his back before I basically did this for what would then be the right reasons, but potentially took him out of his job. Okay. So we mentioned MRI. What's one other thing that we could potentially do to assess or technically supposed to do to assess his abductor function? Jeff, you know? Yeah, like an EMG or an EMG of conduction. Yeah, okay. Right. Well, the yeah. other thing is physical exam. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, just... So he's fused perfectly, just like the textbook says, about 25 degrees of hip flexion, 10, yeah. 15 degrees and of I'm, abduction. I'm not uh, talking about his range of motion. I'm oh. saying put your hand on his glute and ask him to ah. squeeze oh. it and see if it's working. Okay. Um, because there are a lot of ways to fuse a hip, some of which respected the abductors and some didn't. Okay. Looking at this x-ray, you see the cerclage cables. I think they probably did a trochanteric slide, fused the hip, and then put it back down. So it's possible that the, the trochanter and the abductor mechanism have healed and that there is um, reasonable or there is some abductor function. I, I would expect it to be compromised, but I would expect there to be some abductor function. What I would say to the patient in terms of his employment, if he's not using a cane now, it's more likely after surgery when his hip moves and he has to rely on a relatively weak abductor that he will need a cane. And that may interfere with his ability to walk a fence line, you know, but I, I would guess this guy, as I sit here, would have some abductor function, albeit weak. Okay. So, um, yeah, great discussion, all very good points. Certainly not something you want to just sign up for surgery the first time you meet him. So I made him come back. We talked about things. We got a sed rate. We got a CRP. It's all normal. So now you're going to do the surgery. All right. Are you doing it all at once? You staging this, Tom? You taking the hardware out first? What are you thinking? Uh, I would probably do it in a single fell swoop. Uh, I think, uh, you know, let's, let's put it this way. 
I would tell him if I'm really struggling and I've been there a few hours to get your hardware out, then we're not going to do, we're not going to complete this at that time. Otherwise, I, I think, you know, all the stuff looks fairly recent. There isn't anything there that looks like it's old stuff that I can't get out. Um, so I, I would take the locking screw out. I'd take the, take the distal screws out. I, you know, I'd surclage distally. I'd use a Wagner style stem and then we can talk about what to do on the socket and get the other two screws out. Okay. Anyone else, any other different stage in it, Dad, Jeff? So, so his, his wife told me in pre-op, I actually had that discussion just like I said, look, if I'm struggling, you're the last case of the day because this is complex. I'm not going to sit here at 12 o'clock at night putting a new socket in. And she said, we, our insurance is going to be this and this, and we really got to have this done because he's got to get back to work in January. So a little bit of added pressure. Yeah, so don't put it on the last case of the day. Because, uh, <laughs> oh, you put this on first. So your elective patients wait well, later? You may, you may do this on a special day. Oh, special it's, day. It's a case special that day. you don't normally <laughs> operate on Friday, but you, you put this case on Friday. It's the only one you do. And the reason I say that, I would, I would be taking this hardware out all at once, thinking about doing that and then the total hip. But I would not underestimate the difficulty you will encounter taking this hardware out. Uh, and it may be that you have to cut the lag screw in, in half uh, take it out in pieces, cut the neck. Uh, so I'd be prepared for all that kind of slog to get the hardware out. I wouldn't underestimate it. It could all come out very easily, uh, but it could also be uh, a real production. Okay. So now we're, we're, we're inside the operation. It looks like um, my fellow got all the hardware out while I was in the other room doing a couple of primary joints. Nice. Um, so... <laughs> Maybe I'm leading too much clues here, but Jeff, how, how are, I don't know if you've done one of these before or in fellowship or in, in your training, but how do you identify the hip socket? Like what's going on? Like what, what techniques can we utilize to start the reconstruction here? <clears throat> yeah, in case it wasn't obvious, I would not do this anterior, I don't think. I would do this posterior. <laughs> anterior, yeah. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, I'd, I'd, I would bring in C arm just like this and make sure okay. that I, I see where I'm at. If it's not obvious anatomy, kind of where well, the troke is and things before I make a neck cut, I'd probably take out sort of like a napkin ring like you would from the front and then just start kind of reaming, maybe even ream under fluoro um, and, and see where I'm headed as I'm going constantly checking the front and back wall, make sure I'm going in the right direction in that plane, because you can't ever see that on the fluoro. Um, and uh, yeah. Anything different, Tom? You're doing this posterior, you're gonna put a pen or something up where you think the top of the socket is. Are you, any, any other tips or tricks on getting this massive bone out of your way? No, I think, I think so, if you go back to the prior film, I, I, I would sort of plan out taking a reasonable amount of bone. So I, you know, you could sort of say, well, where do I want my osteotomy for my, for my stem to sit at? And that might be like, I don't know, centimeter above what you see of the lesser. And then I'd probably try to expose further down around the bone. And I, you know, I would probably do like a napkin ring like you talked about and slowly work my way down to where I'm comfortable that I'm probably down inferiorly around the socket if I could. I mean, a lot of that stuff superiorly can chip away with impunity. So I'm not sure I'd start reaming initially. I would probably want to identify some normal contour of the acetabulum before I put a reamer in there. Gotcha. If I could. Ted, for, you, you've done a lot of these in your career. So is, is this bone hard? Is it soft? What do you experience when you get in there? Yeah. No, I, I mean, I haven't done a lot of these. I've, I've done maybe five, um, just guessing. Uh, so there's, there's not a lot of these out there. But, yeah, you look at that bone, look at the x-ray. It's relatively radiolucent. Uh, it hasn't seen a lot of stress in quite a while. There will be parts down medial and inferior where it's harder, and that's going to shift your reamer the wrong direction. So you've got to look at that and kind of think about, okay, well, what are the, what are the pitfalls here? What, what am, what am I going to encounter that's going to be really hard bone? What's going to be really soft? The soft part is up high and lateral, so it's going to send your reamer the wrong way. That's why these comments about knowing where your reamer is with whatever method you choose are really important so you get that cup in the right place because all, all the hard bone is inferiorly there. Okay. Sort of what we did, we have it protected. And one thing we didn't mention, these, these people are also at very high risk for ephemeral neuropathy as well. Um, 
So we got to be careful with that. But saw coming in, starting to chew away some bone. And then, like Jeff said, there's some, I didn't save all of them, but some staged reamer shots there um, trying to get down. And to Tom's point, you can now see I finally was able to uncover the inferior aspect of the acetabulum and get that retractor down there. What was the status of the abductors? Uh, completely healthy. Yeah. Well, wow. no, they, they, they were intact. Healthy. They were intact. I mean, yeah. they were contractile with, with stimulation. Um, uh, but I think similar to what we talked about this morning in dysplastic cases, something like this, you have to find intraoperative landmarks to Tom's point because it's, it's weird. It, nothing looks right. right. So you got to find something that looks normal and then start basing it off of there. But this is proof that you can still get intraoperative x-rays from alternative approaches other than the DA, right? Of course. Okay, so we got our socket in. Um, we didn't really mention much about this, the, the femoral side of things. Um, and all those screw holes. What are you using, Jeff? What are you using for your femoral side of the reconstruction on this? <clears throat> um, go back to the, the film. I'd, I'd probably want to try and get something past those distal holes. Okay. Um, so those are way down. You know, another option might have been to uh, you could leave the side plate and cut it right below the, where that screw's coming out and leave the bottom screws in below what you want and kind of finish somewhere in between and spanning the side of the plate. But I'd probably take the whole thing out, maybe use a, ooh, probably a revision. I would probably use a revision style implant uh, modular tapered stem. Okay. How, how do you decide where to make your osteotomy? Just pure pure floral. I, I did not pre-op like I, you. You can see the lesser, is that correct? You can see the lesser. So you just go yep. above it? Just sort of went above it. Just okay. wanted to start taking bone out. Okay. Knowing that I, I had planned for a revision style stem so I could care less about the proximal femoral bone stock. I was sure. going to base everything distally. So I didn't want to cut off his trochanter. Um, which was, wasn't really much there based on the cerclage cables and everything else that we saw. Um, so anyways, there's the final construct. Yeah, um, that's great. Uh, switched back to a left. It was a right interop, but then we switched it back. But how's he, is he, how's he walking? How's he doing? So it was a you know, learning point for me. Good point. I saw him a year later. He hit, his hip moves. He can sit in a chair. He's smiling. But one of the biggest things that he was complaining about now is that he has to use a cane now. And I didn't think about that. So that's a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up. But um, he's happy because he's sitting in a chair. He's sitting in the car. He's been able to go to a Broncos game and all this other stuff, right? Yeah. But, yeah, good point. All right, we got a few more minutes here. We'll move on to a different case now. 50-year-old uh, male. 10 years of right hip pain, worse of the last two years, otherwise healthy. Like most of the patients we see, um, he had hip surgery. He has no idea what it was. Um, his uh, left leg is uh, shorter than his right by three centimeters. Again, typo there. And he has some weak abductors. He has a well-heeled uh, lateral incision. Sorry, his right is shorter. So it's a 50-year-old male with an unknown history of surgery tom okay what age was the surgery and so you know to me Four years ago. somewhat decreased bone quality again a slightly larger male but really i don't see much going on on the socket side other than it looks somewhat shallow on the lateral view and i again this to me looks like a necrotic head um I've heard of the Rocky Mountain High, so I'm just wondering if that's influencing <laughs> your patients. But uh, off the top of the, uh, right now as I see this, it, this looks to me to be the most bread and butter case you've shown. So obviously I'm missing something big. No, no, oh. this, was, this was shown, I mean, I think basically again, you know, um, I think he had a femoral neck fracture, went on to AVN, um, probably had it pinned, pins were subsequently removed. Um, the socket, though, um, does look shallow. Um, you're going to have to fight through some bone to get the uh, socket down into the right location. Um, but uh, otherwise, a pretty straightforward um, case. All right. 59-year-old, right hip and thigh pain. He has a known history of osteochondroma of his proximal femur. 
and he is a construction worker as well. Um, limited hip flexion, uh, an obligatory external rotation with negative five of internal rotation. Um, and uh, otherwise, his physical exam, uh, fairly normal. There's his pre-ops. Is this something that the arthroplasty surgeon should be tackling by themselves? What other workup are you getting, Tad? Well, uh, important to know if this is an isolated osteochondroma. That'll, uh, there, there are multiple osteochondromas, and they start to have pain. Uh, that's that's a little bit of a red flag. This one has a funny looking x-ray appearance. Uh, you know, you've got the widened metaphysis and the sclerosis, uh, but it's a little bit mottled. There's a little bit of, uh, it looks like new bone formation here. I would show this to my oncologist. I have a little bit of concern here about the potential for malignant transformation, even though in an isolated osteochondroma, it's unlikely, but uh, you may be trying to uh, you may be trying to slip one bias here, Hogan. I'm not sure. Do you have anything else? Yeah, we, we have a pretty good relationship with our tumor surgeons and be a quick email, look at this x-ray, do I, you know, probably getting an MRI and uh, seeing what else, what other workup okay. might need to be done beforehand, before. Well, but, but the other thing is that hip joint isn't that bad. Yeah. Does he have pain at night? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's all, all isolated to his groin. I'm going to add some, some stuff here. Oh. Uh, he had an intraarticular injection a while back. He gave him 100% pain relief for a month. 100% gone. So now he's back in your office saying, I know it's my hip joint because the injection you gave me gave me 100% pain relief. It's been six months now. So I had a month of pain-free living, and now I have five months of agony. All right, so your tumor surgeon says they're not interested. It's not active. They looked at it. They have, a, they have real surgery to do um, with real tumors, so it's back in your clinic. How are you planning this total hip? Ted. <sighs> okay. Um, yeah, you know, back to, the, that, back to the diagnosis and the, I think Tom's observation that the joint doesn't look that bad. I, I'd probably... I'd get an MRI on this uh, to look at, and, and maybe with some T1 row imaging to look at the uh, articular cartilage, and then also have another look at that lesion below. But let's just lesion's skip. normal, cartilage looks terrible on the okay. degenerate right. MRI. So let's just say we're we're doing our total hip, and then so the technical <laughs> aspects of this, uh, you've got a wide metaphysis, uh, you've got some sclerotic bone there medially. Um, I I template it, but um, I my guess is that I can use, uh, I like a double taper wedge here, uh, milled distally and broached proximally. I think I could use that in this case as, as I look at these x-rays without a template on it. So you're not worried about the medial calcar support for a dual tapered stem? No. You're okay with that? Jeff, you? you using anything different or planning for anything different? Yeah, I have, I have no experience with this kind of thing, so I, I wouldn't know. But... Um, I'd probably have something that would at least have some sort of seal stability, either like one of those reaming uh, dual tapers or a revision style stem. Right. So we've heard a lot of talk of, you know, I showed some cases where we're using revision tapered style stems. I just want to get the opinion of the panel here real quick. Are you worried about modularity of, the, of our current tapered stems? Are you worried about the modularity of the stem body junction? Well, we had the fracture issues. I think those have not been reported lately. Uh, you mean in terms of some ion degree taper fretting? Sure, I have some worries. But I think to me, there's not a lot to be gained by using a modular Wagner style stem here because proximally that's quite capacious. So I think I would use the unibody Wagner here. So you'd go, you'd go not non-modular, but distal fixation with right. some Right, even sort though of, yeah. he's young and I'd love to get something to grow in up there. I mean, that's a very expansile metaphysis. You can use an AML? No, no, no. Eight inch? Why not? It's a great stem. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> I'd like to preserve at least the upper half of his femur. <laughs> so I thought I'd do that. <laughs> Tad, AM, no, no AML? Fully porous coated no. primary stem? No, I don't think you need that. I mean, I've put lots of AMLs in in my life, but uh, 
you don't you don't need that here. I think you've got you can have gradual fixation, porous distally, grit blast. Uh, I mean, porous proximally, grit blast distally, get fixation, engage the diaphysis and the metaphysis. I, I think modularity is great in revision and when you need it, but it's a compromise. I don't tend to use it in primaries if I can avoid it, um, just because it's just not necessary. It's one more moving part that if you don't need it, don't use it. Okay. I guess before I show the x-rays, one other thing that I don't think we've touched on as part of a primary hip panel, bearing surface of choice, Jeff? Uh, ceramic on poly. Ceramic on poly. Age cutoffs? Ceramic on poly for everybody. For everybody. Tad? Uh, that's typically what I'm using. Ceramic on poly for everybody. Tom? Uh, ceramic on poly up to 60, then metal on poly unless it's greater than a plus 5 in my system, and then I go ceramic head. The other thing to talk about here is offset gain because that's a, that's a very steep neck angle and almost any implant you choose is going to build them out to the side. Now you could say that maybe some of this is an illusion because of the widening and the metaphysis from that, that uh, osteochondroma. But I think, you know, to me, the backup stem I'd have, and I, it would be different than what I said about the metaphysis would, if I could, I'd consider using an SROM again here. Okay. So this is what was done, sort of on block resection of the tumor with a distally fixed Wagner revision style stem. To your point, trying not to uh, over increase the offset, which the good news is you got rid of the lesser, so it's very hard to measure postoperatively. So you why just. Did you, why did you take it out, the, the osteochondroma? It's just. Not this, case. this wasn't my case. Not your case? No. So, so we had. Grab that mic so people can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Come on up, Derek. The worker for this case was interesting. Um, this was actually referred to me by our tumor surgeons um, for two reasons. One is they didn't think that they could resect the tumor without disrupting the blood supply of the hip uh, in such a way that it would guarantee avascular necrosis. Uh, the other issue is that they didn't think all the pain was coming from just the, the tumor. There was an element of pain that was coming from the tumor with the impingement uh, on all of the muscles, and the MRI actually showed a lot of sort of edema in the muscles in that area. And then the other part is when we injected his hip, he got relief, but he got partial relief. So he, he told us it was like 50 to 60% of his pain went away with the injection. So we did think there was an element coming from both the hip and from the tumor. Got it. Um, uh, so we took out the tumor. All right, we got five minutes left. Let me just say one other thing, though, in that case, because I've done a woman who had this bilaterally with this massive proximal metaphysis. It impinges. You have to remove, at least I had to remove that to actually have impingement free range of motion. The downside is she developed a fairly large hematoma in that area after surgery. So here we go. Last, last case real quick. 47-year-old um, history of end-stage renal dialysis or end-stage renal disease now on dialysis um, with right hip and groin pain. Past surgical history pertinent there for a knee fusion. Um, left total knee without complication. She walks less than one block. Uh, there's the hip range of motion. So we've seen this case before earlier. So um, I think that the questions are outlined there below. So approach, knee fusion. Jeff, can't bend the knee. How are you going to approach this? This hip? is actually my case, so I should probably excuse oh, myself. Oh, you get off then. Tad. I, uh, I'll do uh, a, a posterior approach. Posterior uh, approach. Awkward uh, because you can't bend the knee. Um, but, uh, yeah, you just have to grab the leg and turn. But it's... Um, you can still adduct it and still unwieldy but manageable. But the other thing, though, is you don't want to over lengthen her, right? It's going to make her harder to walk. Yeah. So you, you do have to be careful about, you know, she looks like she's really not short. Unfortunately, you're going to build her back out to the side, which is going to functionally lengthen her. So I, I don't know in this case. I'd ha I talked to her about the fact that, like, let me ask you this. So she's walking now. Has she noticed a difference in how the leg feels on the fuse? This is the, the ipsilateral side. She's ipsilateral side, yeah. Has she noticed a difference in walking, like she feels like she's limping more on the right side? Yeah, more pain. Just no, no, pain. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, does she feel like she has a short leg now? Oh. Um, 
No, she doesn't feel a difference. I think that side right. actually felt long to her with the She doesn't with feel the a difference. Yeah. Well, it felt well, long. What else can, what else can it's you a, get? It's a guy. It's a, it's do, a we, do we, you know, maybe No, I understand. Full it's just she may have, you know, he or she may have to do more of a circumdiction gait with the fused knee after the surgery. Just try, mm -hmm. talk to them about it. So we're talking about, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's length all, problems. If, they, if they're long before, you're going to lengthen them even further. I think technically, I, I'd, I'd like to scrub him with Dr. Vale and see how he dislocates the hip with a straight knee. Are you worried about the sciatic nerve at all in that situation? Well, I'll, uh, you know, as you guys have talked about in these other cases, I'll cut out a segment of the neck and then pull it out, and I'll have then pull the head out of the socket, and I'll have immediate access and plenty of bone graft. So it's not going to be that hard. Yeah. All right. Okay. So that's what was done. That's good. And, um, yeah, she feels great now. So we'll we'll end a little bit early, um, unless you guys have questions. Um, we can get on to the next section. Uh, two minutes. Thank you guys very much for your participation. All right.